Good morning, everyone. My name is Rima Najashibi, and I'm founder and president of Global Hall 365. Thank you for joining us this morning with your favorite brew to learn more about the prevalence of child marriage and human trafficking in California, other states, and nationally, and what we could do together to prevent future victims from happening. We urge you to follow us on social media and LinkedIn at Global Hall 365. And please ask your friends and family to do so. We would like to increase our followers by a thousand by the end of July to spread more awareness in order to save lives. I would like to thank our top donors, the Kling Family Foundation, Vicky Gum, and platinum sponsor Daryl Sheets Esquire from the law offices of Daryl C. Sheets. Daryl, please wave. Uh, some of our board members and team are here with us today, Kristen Manna, uh, Tamara Farrar, Dot Leach, and of course, Daryl Sheets, he's the attorney for the nonprofit. We also have our interns, Josie Dunbar, and I'm sure Adriana and Victoria will join us soon. Uh, we have a special guest with us today, uh, uh, Lynn Shaw, she's the radio show, show host and producer from New York. And we'll also will be joining us Dr. Eleanor Kennelly Gatton, who is the VP and Director of Public Policy from ENCOSI, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. They will help me co-host this event. And Al will add their bio in the chat. If you represent an organization, please include your name, uh, the name of the organization, right after your name by utilizing the rename feature and the three dots. Also, any questions, please include them in the chat. Our interns will help us monitor the chat for me. Al will be entering the relevant links and PDFs for all of us uh, as this meeting progresses. Everyone, please set Zoom to gallery view until we start actual meeting. Well, we started the actual meeting, then you can switch to speaker view. We will be um, asking you to participate in our digital letter writing campaign to end child marriage in California and other states. And also, if you represent an organization or you're an elected official or a community leader, we would like you to become a partner in the California Coalition to End Child Marriage, which we launched in uh, September 14, 2019. Welcome and to our uh, June Global Hope 365 monthly educational series. Our mission at Global Hope 365 is to end harmful practices against women and girls, such as child marriage, human trafficking, and other forms of gender-based violence. I wanted to share some of the recent successes with you. Rhode Island has become the fifth state in the nation to pass the No Child Marriage Under 18 No Exception, legislation once it passed in both houses and the governor signed it uh, also new york will be the sixth state once the governor signs the bills that passed both houses uh, i was able to testify in front of both houses in these two states and or submitted a written testimony however as you know child marriage is still legal in the u.s in 45 states including california and we have a lot of work ahead of us. Not only is it legal in California, but there's no minimum age. All what you need to do is, uh, all what you need to have is parental consent and initial approval. You've heard from the survivors we work with, and uh, you've heard them indicate that they were coerced by their parents, and 50% of them, it was to cover a crime, na namely statutory rape. With your continued support, we will be able to continue with this life transforming work. Now let's get to human trafficking. And that's why we have our distinguished guest here, Senator Dave Cortese. Human trafficking is a $150 billion industry victimizing over 25 million people globally every year. It's the third largest crime industry and the fastest growing. We've been able to um, Basically, we have a campaign to raise awareness in order to educate um, the constituents and the people, the public, our society, in order to prevent future victims from happening. So Global Hope 365 is about education and prevention, raising awareness, education, and prevention. We do not provide direct services to victims of human trafficking. 
So now, uh, let me introduce our very special and distinguished guest, Senator Dave Cortese. Uh, he was elected in November of 2020 to represent State Senate District 15, which encompasses much of Santa Clara County in the heart of Silicon Valley. And so I applaud him for authoring SB 435, since he is from Silicon Valley. Along with his accomplished career as an attorney and business owner, the senator previously served as Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for over a decade and four years as board president on the San Jose City Council for eight years, including two years as vice mayor and as trustee of the East Side Union High School District for eight years. Al will enter the full bio for you in the chat. So if anybody gets it about the prevalence of human trafficking and the need to prevent future victims and provide redress for these victims from being exploited online, it's Senator Corsese. Welcome, Senator. Um, did you all know that over 45 million children ages 10 through 17 use the internet? Among them, one in every five have been sexually solicited. One in four has encountered unwanted pornography. 60% of the teen have received an email and said message from a stranger and half have communicated back. Nicholas Kristof, opinion columnist for the New York Times, recently profiled victims of child sexual abuse who were monetized and exploited through porn sites such as Pornhub. Uh, content that is uploaded includes rape, child, child rape, revenge pornography, and other forms of sexual abuse. In 2015, Christoph detailed in his column, the children of Pornhub, 6.5 million, were reported to the authorities in the United States. Last year, the figure was 69 million. And the National Human Trafficking Resource Center has determined that the largest majority of human trafficking cases reported nationally each year are from the state of California. So Senator Dave Cortese introduced SB 435, the Ending Online Sexual Trafficking and Exploitation Act. Senator, please tell us more about how prevalent online sexual exploitation is in California how SB 435 will help when it passes, the status of the bill, and how can we, as committed citizens, help you make sure that it passes? Thank you, Rima. Thank, thank you, Dawn, for your, your interest in this um, and your own advocacy, uh, which is, um, you know, in my, my opinion, just as important or oftentimes more important than the act of, of introducing a bill. Uh, and trying to move it through the process. Um, and I'll talk about that more hopefully at, at some point here before we're done, uh, just in terms of how important um, support positions and active advocacy is. <clears throat> Let me just say by way of background that um, I had I had a couple of eye openers that uh, sort of came late to me in terms of you know, sexual assault, sex, sex trafficking, um, and human trafficking in general, um, really after I spent eight years on the school board, and then after I spent eight years on the San Jose City Council, and a couple years of vice, as vice mayor, um, big city, right, biggest city in the area, third largest big uh, city in the state, but we weren't doing much in this space. Um, you know, it wasn't the kind of thing that you would, would talk about much, and when I got to the Board of Supervisors, um, within my first couple of years, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at our local domestic, domestic violence conference. Um, and my staff worked up speaking points for me, as they are <laughs> supposed to do. And the speaking points themselves became uh, really the, one of my first eye openers. I was really taken aback by the speech that I was charged with giving, which was was basically this complete outstripping of the system, you know, even in our own county, um, by the number of, of potential uh, claims or responses that were needed, um, if that makes sense. So, and this is just in the sexual assaults alone. Um, these are just, these are just the numbers of people who actually can find a hotline 
and call it, uh, who aren't necessarily being drugged or trafficked or exploited indirectly, like we're going to talk about with 435. Um, and I had been working and continue to work um, just by way of comparison um, on on the homelessness issue, which is you know obviously at, at epidemic proportions in the state of California. In our own county at that time, we had 7,400 homeless. That's actually increased since then. Um, but I was looking at these numbers, realizing that we had 10,000 calls a year uh, to um, you know our sexual assistance, sexual assault hotlines, uh, many of which were not being responded to adequately. Um, come um, around that time, Super Bowl 50, Super Bowl 50, which descends on the Bay Area, and suddenly being briefed on the notion that basically uh, the world's sexual assault traffic, I'm sorry, sex, uh, human trafficking traffic and sexual assault uh, related trafficking was going to descend on Santa Clara County. But was even more alarming about that was when they started to show us the graphs about how much the increase was going to be um, around the time of the Super Bowl uh, was what was alarming was looking at what the baseline was before the Super Bowl even came and to find that the Bay Area, um, the San Francisco Bay Area, including Silicon Valley, San Jose, Santa Clara County were um, one of the top hot spots in the world for human trafficking. So we started working on, um, I did, on creating uh, a, a commission in the county, creating a, a task force um, on the law enforcement side, and then giving budgetarily the resources for the first time to the sheriff's department um, in the county uh, to create essentially a, a SWAT team or response team that would that would not just be uh, in reaction to complaints, because law enforcement is primarily a complaint-driven model, but would actually go out and, and try to uncover and pursue cases, and it's been successful. So fast forward, I become a state senator. Along the way, I had worked with um, a, a woman, uh, Professor Michelle Dauber from Stanford University, who, um, among other things, uh, you know, was a co-founder of uh, Enough is Enough, and has done a lot of work around Title IX on the sexual assault side. Um, and that was kind of ushering, all of that ushering me into the state Senate. So on December 5th of last year, I was still a county supervisor. On December 7th, I became a state senator. And I, I had already decided I wanted to introduce a bill in this area. And SB 435 really, um, in a sense, goes you know, into another realm in this virtual realm beyond all of that, right? This is beyond uh, physical sheriff's department um, SWAT teams or anything like that. It says um, for whatever problems we have uh, at the level of just street traffic, we've got this uh, extraordinary, um, these overwhelming numbers on the internet um, that are just absolutely unregulated and out of control as far as I can see. So what Senate Bill 435 attempts to do, and, and I have a legal background, um, and I, I practiced some criminal defense, full disclosure, um, you know, for about six years while I was mostly doing transactional work, uh, but I, I took on a lot of pro bono cases for the NAACP and so forth. So I only did that because I interjected that because I, I have, um, you know, enough legal background, you know, to understand. Um, you know, the differences, uh, you know, in terms of um, what con what constitutes content-based regulation under the First Amendment or um, what kind of remedies on the civil side might be appropriate to try to use as tools to, to put an end to some of this or at least to create not only a deterrent but um, an avenue for folks to respond. And, and so what SB 435 does... Um, and I will tell you that Christoph article that you were referencing, I think it's the same one, um, was certainly another eye opener and, and inspiration in this regard. Um, but um, what, what 435 does is it creates civil recourse. It says, you know, what we, we've heard a lot, including from the Audrey Pot Foundation, um, which is, you know, came out of, of the loss of a 15 year old 
a girl by way of suicide who was was bullied um, online and offline by um, sexually explicit photographs or at least naked photographs that were put into a sexually explicit context. And that's kind of the problem here when you get, for those of you who have legal backgrounds, right, that, uh, and maybe for those of you who don't, when you start trying to thread the needle in terms of, you know, the difference between uh, a naked Mona Lisa, if there's such a thing, and a, a, a naked photograph of, let's move away from the 15-year-old, a 19-year-old, uh, someone of age, um, is, it, is, it in the, is it in the context of, of tra uh, trafficking and sexual exploitation? And so what we came up with, with, I think, some great legal minds from Stanford, from Harvard, and then our own legislative council was, look, um, it's pretty hard to just directly regulate um, the uploading the, or to, in order to prevent the uploading of information onto the internet. And of course, that's what's happening. Folks are paying a fee to upload an image of somebody else. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's um, uh, not retaliatory, but it is, um, it, is in, it, is, it is intended to harm a former spouse, uh, for example, or right. a significant other. And you know all those fact patterns because all of you are advocates and all this, but what could we do um, without cutting off, you know, the opportunity to post content in the first place? What could we do to sort of immediately um, um, create relief, you know, in the civil, in the civil system um, to, to get it back down? And I started, I'm sorry, I'm rambling off a little bit, but I started to talk about the Audrey Pop Foundation. You know, one of their biggest concerns is, and one of the biggest concerns with that particular case um, of Audrey Pot was that, you know, from the moment that it was discovered, from the moment that the harm and the damage was discovered, that this uploading had occurred, that the sharing had occurred, there was basically no way uh, to get it back down. There was, there was no way to get uh, the images back down, or the what we what we would now call under SB 435 actionable images. So, or actionable uh, photographs is really what we had to sort of narrow narrow this down to. So, some it, of the, so I just wanted to conclude that this would this would give a plaintiff, a claimant, a victim, um, the right to notify um, whoever. Um, is in that stream of commerce, including the internet provider, uh, to take that content down, um, and um, and if they don't do it, um, FD fines involve a hundred thousand dollars for every two hours that it continues to stay up for over eighteen year olds, and for under eighteen year olds, two hundred thousand uh, dollars for every two hours of electronic distri distribution after after this notice of claimed infringement. So. Um, I don't want to go on and on and on, but you know we can talk about the, the threading the needle part of that. What what do you need to do to make that hold up? You know, is it is it defensible? You know, from a First Amendment standpoint, uh, or uh, from any other uh, standpoint in terms of the infringement on appropriate con any infringement on appropriate content? And we believe it is. We're not telling anyone. It's, as much as I'd like to, <laughs> the bill isn't really telling anyone. You can't publish, right? You can't publish content. What it's saying is, if you do and you're put on notice by a bona fide victim, you better take it down. And if you're not sure it's a bona fide victim, you better take it down anyway until you have a chance to investigate whether it is or not. Um, and uh, we don't think any of that violates the First Amendment. In fact, quite the contrary. At this point, the publications already occurred, right? Um, whether it's a whether it's an inadvertent newspaper photograph, which some people are worried about, you know, uh, the sort of the naked image on the beach or something like that, or, 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 you know, somebody who is victimizing a war, um, who's, and you have a graphic image, um, we're not saying that you shouldn't have published that. We really don't think you're going to get a victim's complaint on that um, in the context of this bill, trafficking, right? You may get a complaint about privacy or usurping an image or something. But this bill is about this bill is about trafficking images for um, in, in in the context of sex trafficking. Worst case scenario, um, that newspaper or that service, uh, if they have a legitimate position, again, 
responds and says that this doesn't fall under SB 435 and we're going to continue on. So we like the bill, but organizing around a bill like this is going to be extraordinarily important. You ask, what can we do? We, we introduced the bill and we were really receiving no, no active opposition at all. Um, and we got into the committee process for a first hearing in the Senate, which is usually very routine. Um, and we were noticing that our bill wasn't getting set for a hearing date right away. Um, and essentially, um, you know, <laughs> live and learn, right? Uh, this won't happen to me too many more times in my career. We started kind of getting the clock running out because there's only a certain number of hearings before you reach the deadline. And all of a sudden, without publishing, an actual bill analysis or request for amendments, the committee staff said, you know, we have some issues with this. We do think it, it creates a First Amendment issue. You know, we, we're not, they, they started presenting examples that really aren't even covered by fact patterns that aren't even covered by the bill as, you know, concerns. And, um, you know, we got into a, I, I got into a pretty robust debate with them. And, the chairman of, of the committee, this would be judiciary in the Senate. Um, but, you know, on a Thursday, when they're not, get, normally what would happen is the committee would offer you amendments, this is the way the process works, in writing. And you look at them and say yes or no, or you counter those. It's about words, of words of legal significance, right? What they were doing is just saying, we have an issue, but we're not going to put any proposed amendments in writing. Um, so we had, we had nowhere to go. So because we're in, in California in a two-year session right now, um, we, we turn this into what's known as a two-year bill, right? We come back in January, um, but we're going to come back <laughs> organized. Um, we're going to come back and make it very, very uncomfortable um, for the committee or any of my colleagues to uh, play games with the process, you know, and try to delay, use delay tactics you know, to, to kill a bill, which is probably one of, you know, the most common tactics there, there, there is. Uh, what pains me deeply, deeply, uh, and I think you understand this from the overall background I gave you in terms of my involvement with these kinds of issues, um, is that, and I, I told the consultant this, I told the chair of the committee this, um, that you force us into a two-year bill. What you're telling me is that it's okay it's okay uh, for these these sites, particularly the commercial sites, to keep racking up victims day by day by day from now until January, uh, because you have no urgency. And uh, yeah. it, it, that just that pains me to no end. And I think it's I actually think it's tragic. And um, you know, we'll, we January will be here before you know it, and we'll have about thirty days to really move quickly. At that point, we'll have to be pre-organized. Uh, to make sure that the other votes on the committee, uh, you know, whether the chair ever comes around or not, you know, understand that this is extremely important to to people in the state of California. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Senator. Uh, we understand that because both Lynn Shaw and myself um, sit on a weekly call regarding the Earn It Act. And the Earn It Act basically says, uh, should the tech companies, Pornhub, OnlyFans be accountable to victims and survivors through and on their platforms? So it's a step in the right direction. It holds those forms and the companies that own them accountable. And so we have a weekly phone call at 1130 every Friday, uh, Zoom now, with staffers from the Hill because we're trying to pass this on the federal level. Uh, it's uh, basically hosted by INCOSI, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and, and they have partners in all states. And what we could do for SB 35, because I know some of the partners on the Earn It Act are here with us today, uh, we can submit uh, letters of support for SB 435 when you tell us to, now that Natasha has my email address, she needs to tell us, okay, submit the letters of support now and we'll get you multiple, numerous letters of support for SB 435. 
it's not only tragic, it's unconscionable that not pass it because the bill basically says uh, that it is um, if somebody was coerced, right? Uh, if somebody was coerced um, and this was done without their knowledge, right? Yes, yes. It it is. It is. Um, I can give you the actual definition, but uh, the you know those definitional points. But it says. Um, <clears throat> It, it, says, it, says, it says actional actionable material, first of all, is right. is very simple. It's a moving or still photograph in any technological form, regardless of whether it's been altered, because people do that, as we know, the deep yes. week and all that, of a person or their identifiable likeness in which they are naked or that is sexual in nature for which each either of the following is true. So it's not just a naked picture, right? This is, where you, this is where the part you were just talking about comes in. It's it's a naked picture uh, where it was coerced, where it was made or obtained by trickery or subterfuge, or stolen, uh, made, obtained, or distributed without knowledge or without or beyond the expressed permission freely given of the person in the photograph or the person who's identified identifiable like disappears in the photograph. So we that's a pretty tight definition, and yes. it doesn't. You know, most of the what ifs that you hear from people that are trying to slow you down on this, including the Internet Association and folks like that, that have been very quietly, of course, lobbying it without really putting up the opposition letters, because I don't think they want to put anything in writing to yeah. say that they're against this, because it obviously would mean they want to continue, you know, the way they're going, the status quo. But I mean, it, most of the most of the what ifs, that's what I call them, you know, they kind of what if you to death become, you know, are really vitiated by or responded to by that that paragraph, you know. Uh, what about the person who's, you know, a victim um, and uh, the image is naked or partially naked of, of a bomb explosion, you know, in a community or something like that? What, what happens there? There's no trickery or subterfuge. There may be. There may be distribution without express permission, um, but there hasn't been a complaint yet, right? This this bill doesn't stop you from putting it up. This bill says, you know, if if that individual or their agent comes back to you and says, take it down, then you should take it down. And um, we think that's, again, uh, you know, actually generous, <laughs> yes. actually generous in this context. And uh, I have a question for you. And uh, Dr. Um, Eleanor Kenlingatan just joined us from the National Center on Exploitation. She's the VP of Public Policy there. Uh, she's the one who hosts those weekly uh, meetings with the staffers from the Hill on the Earn It Act. But I, there is an item in that bill that uh, I have a question on, and it says an action brought pursuant to this section shall be commenced within six years of discovery of infringement or within 10 years of the person in the actionable material having reached 18 years of age, whichever is longer. I think I know the answer, but why can't we leave it open? Because sometimes survivors... Right. Yeah. yeah, and it, it, it is it is something. If we were going to offer author amendments, they would be right now. I mean, we didn't get that chance. That's normally what you do is go back and forth and kind of trade amendments with the committee, and we may have to do that uh, in January. In area, we've been asked by sponsors like the Audrey Pop Foundation to take a look at. Uh, I think the first piece of that language keeps it pretty open, open enough. You know, uh, um, six years after discovery. Because discovery could be, you know, twenty-five years later, um, as as things are archived. The the problem, um, and and so, but as we all know, the the um, especially from a sexual assault side, you know, we've seen now um, statutes of limitations, you know, yeah. essentially eliminated, and uh, because of of what happens to children, primarily, um, they're they're yeah. not they're not they're not. I guess psychologically prepared or, or even cognizant enough to bring forward what happened to them until sometimes decades later when 
uh, when it comes out through you know therapy or or whatever other means it comes out. So we we will look at that. The other area in which we um, need to to make sure is clear, or we'll have to do some kind of a some kind of an amendment. I think is it's really easy to require the institutional entities like Pornhub, you know, to put up an agent for notice. It doesn't have to be an agent for process, uh, you know, like a legal, in a legal sense. We're just saying on your site. And frankly, I think this should be on Amazon and everywhere. I mean, yes, Google, yes. People, consumers don't, we you, know, complain, you can't find anybody other than a robot to complain to these days, you know, but um, that may be another bill someday in terms of consumer protection. But just in this area, we're saying, well, put, you got to put up who, who I tender, you know, my, my, my cease and desist order to, you know, I'm the victim. We want this down in two hours, but you need to tell me who the proper uh, delivery point is. And when you have individuals, it's, it, you know, we've been challenged on that a little bit. I think the civil code already does enough there because you could just fall back on ordinary legal process at that point and say, you know, I'm just going to, if you know, it's the, the 17 year old in their family, two blocks down, that's bullying the 15 year old. You can certainly um, serve them right in a way that is um, documented, but um, you know, we, we, we may need to clean that up a little bit just to make sure it's, it's very clear. I'm not sure the language here expressly lays that out very well it talks more about posting up on an internet site right 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 uh the other thing is th that i like because if you hit them in their pocketbook that's when they take notice just like Pornhub and eleanor will tell you during the hearings against uh Pornhub, is that when visa and mastercard stopped uh their Applications from being used for those people who buy these images on Pornhub, that's when they started taking notice, right? right? And I love it that in addition to any other damages awarded that you mentioned in the bill, it says statutory damages in the amount of $100,000 shall be awarded to the prevailing plaintiff to be paid by the defendant for every two hours of electronic distribution after notice. That's, as you mentioned, for anybody over 18, and then 200,000 every two hours for anyone who is under 18. And we heard so many cases on these weekly calls about minors and, you know, as you mentioned, who have committed suicide right. because those images are not being... Uh, taken down as soon as any form is um, notified. Yeah, it's and 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 by the way, there's a section uh, H if you read down into the into the bill, for example, that um, also you know uh, allows injunctive relief. Um, you know what we attorneys call equitable uh, remedy, right? So so in other words, for the person who says, well, by the time I assert this lawsuit, right? They don't take it down, you know, start moving through the system. Um, the damage keeps occurring, right? This is, this is the real thing we're trying to stop in, in, in its tracks is as much as we can. <laughs> um, obviously because of republication, tracking republication now with the internet is so uh, challenging to do, but you know, this does allow you to go right into law in motion in a court once you file the underlying suit and say, and, and we need injunctive relief right now, you know, before we even get to a damages claim. Uh, yeah, stop, H, stop, uh, them, stop them. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. H basically says a civil injunction shall be available to block or interrupt the distribution, including electronic distribution of actionable material. Uh, absolutely. And then uh, we know, again, from uh, through our work and from sitting on these weekly calls, that survivors, and, and we even had speakers on the Global Hope 365 educational series who were victims of human trafficking, uh, sexual assault, uh, some at the age of 12 or 13, but they do not tell anybody about it because of shame. Right. 
And so they, that's why I didn't want that statute of limitations to be there because we heard so many cases where it takes longer than 10 years or others or to uh, um, basically bring an actionable action against uh, these platforms and the entities that provide them. Please put in your questions in the chat. And I see Josie has her hand up. Uh, but uh, if you can help us, if there's any questions uh, in the chat. Okay. Our first question is, this is a state bill. What are the geographical parameters for the victim, California only victims and provider, California only providers? Yeah, great question. So ordinarily, if the harm is done in California, um, then it's actionable in California, right? Regardless of, um, you know, regardless of the location of the original upload, for example. Um, so we're, we're pretty confident about that. Again, dealing with legislative counsel that the case, if, if you just take the what maybe the second part of that question is, yeah, but then what about the other 49 states, the rest of the country, does Pornhub or, or even, you know, Facebook, Google or anybody else, it is amazing how much is going on there. And they're not even primarily in the business of, you know, pushing this kind of content. Um, but I will tell you, um, and, and this is something I think always for us all to remember who are advocates for change. Uh, I learned this in, you know, in one of the biggest counties in the country, Santa Clara County, when I was there for 12 years, when when even one state disrupts that business model, um, it it will change it will change things everywhere. Other states, you know thinking, right? So this this is a this is a cookie cutter business model, very cookie cutter, um, and That's not to com not to compare it to something of lesser significance, but you know, the first time I learned that was when I had a call that said he wanted to take the sugary content out of Happy Meals. And I said, ma'am, we only have a few fast food restaurants in Santa Clara County in our jurisdiction. How's that gonna help anything? And within days of introducing that ordinance, the business model had to be changed around the country because you can't have some of your operations doing one thing and some of your operations doing something else when you have that kind of a, a, a really simplified business model. And that's that's why this, would be a game not not to mention the fact that you know presumably states across the country and uh and other jurisdictions would start adopting you know kind of a me too um statute right it, it would spread quickly so uh thank you to liddell uh liddell for asking uh this question she's from beacon for victims and then Dr. Gatton from Incozi has a question for you, a, a comment and a question. And I know you have to leave in three minutes. Uh, so I'll be uh, very quick. Thank you so much for writing this bill. Uh, Incozi is a strong supporter. What are some of the organizations in California who you hope will enthusiastically support your bill other than Global Health 365, but they have not come around yet? Uh, because we'll be able uh, to, as I mentioned, uh, NCOSI has huge um, reach in all 50 states and we'll be able, um, I will not speak on behalf of Eleanor, but um, what can we do basically to help you and who do you want us to get on your side when you reintroduce it again? Um, as we all know, this isn't a, this isn't a gender-based problem, right? I mean, you know, I think that women's groups, um, especially as um, as advanced as women's movement is getting and um, as widespread as it's getting from an organizational standpoint, once again, that's a good place to go, you know, and Michelle Dauber will help us that with that. I've been helping her with another bill I'm principal co-author of that ends uh, the spousal rape designation in California. We're one of only 11 states in the union that's still has lesser penalties if a spouse um, commits rape than um, a non-spouse, uh, which is not good. Um, and she's a, a great organizer around around uh, women's organizations, but women's, um, how about kids organizations? I mean, I don't think we have anybody other than the Audrey Bott Foundation, which is very, you know, kind of narrowly tailored to, to deal with these kinds of issues. In my county alone, um, 
you know, if I had the time to make all my own phone calls, you know, organizations, we have an organization called Kids in Common, which is kind of an umbrella organization. Uh, the, uh, you know, we have a children's health trust. Um, you know, those, those must be up and down the state. Um, why would they not have an interest in something like this, right? And, and, right. And all you're really asking for is, in, in, at a minimum, take a support position on it. Right. But but if we could do a little more, like you're saying, Rima, um, and, and start bombarding the, the committee members first and then the later the rest of the legislature with letters, um, because then they start seeing constituencies from their own district. And then they start saying, wow, I, I recognize 25 of these 50 letters as organizations that are prominent in my own district. And that has, believe me, that has an effect. I, I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> It starts to get you to think um, differently when you see that kind of. Yes. Response. Not only will we help you get to, and again, I'm not speaking for Dr. Gerdon, uh, to the uh, organizations that are in the human trafficking space, whether in prevention or providing services, but I speak in front of Rotary Club, Honest Clubs. We need all these clubs that will, and we will also, if you give us the talking points or if you tell us who to contact in your office, then we will contact our own members of the Assembly and the Senate in addition to posting letters of support. Because I've posted letters of support of various bills, including one one we won through uh, Assembly One Kari Petri Naris, which will help modernize uh, our system as far as domestic violence victims. And then one that was stalled in the Appropriations Committee, uh, right? It was put in the suspense folder, never to come out. And it was only to force county clerks to report child marriage numbers in California. And we're not saying. I wanted to penalize them a thousand dollars a day when they don't do it. I no. mean, we have a law that went into effect one one twenty nineteen that says you shall report statistics of minors getting married in the state of California, and that was one one twenty nineteen. When we went to the state in one one twenty twenty, we didn't have that many counties reporting and we went to some of them the larger ones and they said well the state didn't ask us for it and we went to the state and they said this is what they said they said we don't have to ask them for it they need to submit it themselves so it was yeah. it was that kind of thing and that's why we wanted to introduce this ad amendment unfortunately it died in the suspense folder so i know it's time it's 9:46 so and, let me, I, and let me just say that appropriations, if you really wanted to, you could kill every bill because or put them on suspense because suspense means that there's some fiscal impact that has not yet been appropriated in the state or the local budget. How would you ever get anything new done? So right. let me just say the political side of that, um, which is deep, <laughs> is that it's and it's just basic, basic relationship politics. You know, the pro tem in, in, in the Senate, um, the president, and the, Tony Atkins in this case, and the speaker, um, Rendon, if they want something to get out of appropriations, it's going to get out of appropriations. I don't care if it's $100 million or 25 cents, okay? Um, because you can always get something out of appropriations and say the legislation is ultimately subject to a budgetary appropriation, you know, upon adoption, upon enactment. And so they can, it can be done. We can talk about this more later on your own. The stuff that you're advocating or, or, or helping to sponsor or, um, you know, or, or move, um, be sure to call upon me to try to help you through that process and to make, we can get people's attention and leadership, um, maybe even beyond what you can do to pay attention. Because when that starts happening, appropriations they do the whole they call it an appropriations dump they make those decisions on all those bills in one week that's <laughs> and right. so you you don't want to get caught up in the you know <laughs> leadership right. hasn't told us to make sure this one lives right if you're if you're not if you're not marked live or die you're just kind of neutral in there um sometimes it's not a good thing yeah thank you so much there's a lot of uh thank yous in the chat for you senator for SB for introducing SB 435 
And I wonder if you have time for one more question or you have to leave. Um, I think I, I have, I, I can. I have about a 20 minute drive and we still got 25 minutes to get there. So Okay, Dot, Dot, did you have a question? I was told that you may have a question. Um, thank you. I earlier, um, Senator, thank you for being with us today and, and for all your work in this area. Let me, I, I want to go back. Dot, let me introduce Dot to the Senator. Dot is the founder of uh, Women Drivers, an interfaith women's group. And so that would be one of the groups that may be uh, good, basically good. a letter of support. She's also been appointed on the Orange County Human Relations Commission. And she has been, uh, she did documentaries. She's been a journalist. So, and she's on our board. Dot, go for it. Thank you, Reem. I appreciate that introduction. Senator, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for your bill. It is it is much needed and hopefully will open the door to uh, even more legislation that will be helpful in this area. Something I wanted to just clarify or ask you about, you were saying that in your early days, um, even before uh, to um, the State Assembly, that you had helped create a task force on law enforcement and uh, the SWAT teams and, and that type of thing. I am wondering that when things like this come together, I think it's first instinct very often to go to law enforcement. What I'm wondering is, is uh, are there ever considerations for appropriating uh, funds to social workers and our mental health workers for the aftercare of the victims. Yes. And, you know, in places like Santa Clara County and I don't know, maybe Orange County and other places, I, I, I don't follow every county, but you know, that's been modeled a lot more with the, with the youth side of the justice system than the adult. However, when we put together the, the task force on trafficking that I was mentioning where the sheriff's department was in, with, with money to actually put you know, a, a team on the streets. It was emphatically, you know, um, uh, the point was emphatically made that um, that the victims uh, were not the perpetrators, and, and that is a big problem, especially with prostitution, as you know. And um, you know, we're, <laughs> we're 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 locking up the wrong people, basically. Um, it, oftentimes, not the traffickers, but the trafficked, and um, and so it's not only important to recognize that on the criminal justice system right from the beginning. So you divert them from booking or from um, incarceration in the first place, get them diverted directly into, if you can, pre-booking directly into the kind of uh, services you're talking about. You know, the, the we, we always call them wraparound services because it's what, it may be mental health services. It may be drug and alcohol per se. It may be um, any number of things. Um, it could be to say you couldn't have a victim who doesn't need anger management uh, at that point themselves, right? Um, so, so all, all of those kind of and, um, and mentoring, you know, and mentoring, you know, somebody in the community that's going to stay with them, you know, until they stabilize and in mainstream. So, you know, yes, <laughs> yes, and I think we need to keep moving in that direction as a state. I, I don't think there's any real. I'm not sure there's any real state mandate, you know, to. Um, to work with victims in that way yet, but we'll get there because we're finally starting to see, I, I think the mental health and behavioral health um, uh, thrust in the state right now legislatively will, will be how we do that because there's a lot of energy around um, mental health services right now, especially post COVID. Um, and, that's that's the way we want to ride, right? We want to get on that and say, how about victims? How about victims? How about victims? And, and that's that's how we'll get there. And I, I understand fully, especially with, you know, the eye openers around law enforcement that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have people who are more like social workers or crisis intervention teams there right at the beginning, you know, and not necessarily trust that um, law enforcement is going to have the tools available to figure out, you know, what to do, especially on a pre-booking basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, is, thank you uh, Senator. I also uh, 
wanted to let you know that Karen Dennis is from the American Association of University Women, and you know they're all over the state. So uh, I'm sure they will help us uh, also submit a letter of support. Thank you, Karen. I see her nodding her head. So we will start a list of these organizations. Uh, Dr. Gutan, would you like to say anything before the, the leaves? No, just Senator, thank you so much for your leadership. We've been testing this concept in other state legislatures, and there's a, a real hunger for this solution in other states. Great. We would love to have some company. And uh, like I said, you know, it's not a gender issue, right, when it comes right down to it. In fact, probably the transgender community and other communities of uh, who self-identify in, in, in non-traditional ways are probably being victimized as much as anybody right now on a per capita basis. But let me just say this, what I'm getting at here is I think we are going, we, I, as an author here, um, my, I think my hope is in women in, in this community, because I think women look at this issue um, with a, a sense of urgency and righteousness that frankly, um, you know, I've yet to see among, among, all, among significant numbers of my male colleagues. And I do think when my male colleagues hear from women, uh, they wake up. Um, and so I just, I just think it's really important. And I'm not trying to put that all on you who are women out there who are in women's organizations. But I, I, I do think, as usual, women um, on this kind of change are going to need to lead the charge and help us lead the charge. Thank you very much. Yeah, we also have students here from Chapman University. And so the young adults and students have a, uh, they're vocal about things and they will help us also make the calls uh, to their elected officials and on social media. And um, I wanted to thank you so much for being here and for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. And we've been able to pass resolutions against child marriage under 18 unanimously in nine cities so far. And even during COVID, when we were polarized politically, and that's because Kristen Manna and I on, Kristen Manna is on the Republican side. She's on my board on the Democratic side, being the vice chair of the Democratic Party in Orange County for 10 years. Uh, we work together because this is not a partisan issue. This is a human rights issue. And so, um, and it's abuse, pure and simple. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. I look forward to working with you very closely in the future. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, so um, we do have a, a an opportunity for a drawing. Uh, thank you, Naveen. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for being here. And I know we even have a friend in Jordan out of the country also listening to this. Thank you so much, Zane, for being here. And other states, thank you. Uh, Kristen, can we do the drawing? We have four tickets from Orange County Soccer. Orange County Soccer Club. Okay. Yes, we have four tickets um, to the game that's going to be held in Irvine on July 6th. It's going to be, I think, one of their um, home games. So we're excited. And I put everybody's name in the hat. I want to thank everyone for being here and all your efforts. Um, this is just such as it's been such an informational morning and I'm so happy that we had the Senator here to speak to uh, us. While, while you, um, before you pull that number, yes. uh, we would like to hear from our platinum sponsor, Daryl C. Sheets, Esquire. Uh, Daryl, you're muted. Yes. I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, Rima. Very informative session as always. Very appreciated all of your effort and hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Kristen, do we have a winner? Yes, we do. All right. Adriana Pham. Oh, wow. All right. Adriana is one of our interns from Chapman University, and she gets four tickets. <laughs> All right. So again, I'm so happy that everybody could join us today. We are so appreciative of you taking time out of your Saturday to be with us and all your efforts. 
Thank you, Rima. Oh, uh, my pleasure. And I'm glad I was able to um, last through the <laughs> session. Thank you, Lynn and Eleanor, for uh, agreeing to co-host with me just in case uh, I got lightheaded because of the... Uh, can, let's switch. Uh, maybe we can... You can edit that part, uh, Al. So does anybody have any question about um, the work of Global Hope or uh, what is Incozy doing about the Earned Act? Uh, anything, any questions for, by anyone here? Can you give us a, uh, an idea of who will be the speaker at the next session? Oh, thank you, Daryl. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I had it on the agenda. Let me get it pulled. Yes. Um, so basically, um, our next speaker is going to be, and that will be July 17, Saturday, July 17. It's up to you to tell us whether 9 or 10 is better for you, but it's going to be on sexting and sextortion because unfortunately young adults text pictures on themselves, nude pictures to, um, to boyfriends or girlfriends. And, uh, they basically, end up being sextorted and uh, some of them have committed suicide because of that or attempted to commit suicide and they're not aware the young adults are not aware that when they do that that means they are sending pornography through the internet and it's a crime and they may have to register as a sex offender so to speak about that is going to be uh, orange count uh, the sexual assault Orange County Deputy District Attorney Jerry Williams, who will speak on that topic. And let me know whether you prefer 9 or 10. She's going to go through the penal codes uh, because I wanted her to, basically it's an education for parents and for young adults. So any parents that you know of, that you, they need to hear about this and any young adults, and we're asking our interns, um, disseminate that information about this next uh, coffee meetup because it's very important that you do that because you never know what might happen and you need to know that when you do that, it's a crime. And you might have to register as a sex offender, which is going to affect your further education and employment going forward. Also, what I wanted to indicate is that uh, what uh, mentioned that what can we do as citizens to end human trafficking here in California and the U.S.? If we want to truly end human trafficking, we have to prevent potential victims from becoming vulnerable in the first place. This is not a quick fix. It's a long game, and your ongoing monthly support will be crucial to our efforts. And so the quick fix will be for us to introduce human trafficking prevention programs in all public schools, in all states, but we need it here in A and Orange County because we do not have that. Um, that is according to AB 1227, and which basically mandates that schools have human trafficking prevention programs. For example, LAUSD, if we're to introduce such a program, uh, and with partnership with the Three Stands Global Foundation, it will take 910,000. Orange County, 685,500. Anaheim, 118,000. And Tustin, 82,000. And so this is what it's going to take to prevent future victims from happening. And again, I wanted to thank our platinum sponsor, Dell or She Seats. Uh, Dr. Gitan and Lynn Shaw for being with us this morning. And all of you, thank you so much. And uh, uh, if you're not on our newsletter email list, please put your email in the chat and we will add you to our email list and you'll get the information about our next event, which is on, on sexting and sextortion. Thank you very much, Rima. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rima. Send me uh, the the name and the title of the person ASAP, and we'll put it out to our supporters in California. Okay, I will do that. I will do that. Thank you.
Okay, anybody else? All right, thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we can end the recording here.